This is the Dean of Travel, Dean Jacobs coming to you from the heart of Africa in Rwanda. In the month of April 1994, a nightmare was unleashed in the country of Rwanda. I remember that time vaguely. I was living back in Seattle, Washington at the time, and some of the news stories that flowed out of Rwanda were horrible and unbelievable. But I also remember not being able to understand it, and resigning myself that there was nothing I could do, a decision that has haunted me ever since. So for my own reconciliation process, I've come to Rwanda to face a past that I was unwilling to address at the time. In this process, I've come to discover some of the ripple effects from the 1994 genocide are still unfolding in the Kivu province of the Congo. Here I was invited to meet the rebel general Laurent Nkunda, a Tutsi general who was once part of the Congolese army. When I arrived in the countryside where the general controls, I found him conducting a seminar in a church at a village. The church was packed with women. The theme for the program, Peace and Reconciliation, begins with the women of the village, or Mama. After about three hours, the seminar ended, and then the general headed out for a tour of the village, and afterwards to meet with the village chief. I spent the night at the headquarters, and later the next day I was able to ask a series of questions of General Kunda. In this process, I learned about the 50,000 Congolese Tutsi refugees still living in Rwanda, who want to come back to the Congo. But the land has roaming elements of the Interhamwe in it, or those who waged the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda and fled afterwards. One of the reasons the general claims for abandoning the Congo army and going on his own is his assertion that those people must be able to return home safely. So he's keeping 2,000 troops under his direct control to make sure that the Tutsi in the area are protected. The general concluded our time together with this. You are crying for Sudan. Cry also for Tutsi. They were killed in Rwanda. Your country didn't intervene and Rwandans were killed. And your country does a great thing to ask for, for forgiveness of Rwandans. But today, in Eastern Congo, there is a genocide in preparation. Why are you going also to ask for pardon if you are informed now? The next day, I met with the United Nations which claimed Nkunda is messing up the stability of the region and also recruiting children for his army, a statement that he denies. Basically, I found the whole situation to be very complex and confusing. But for sure, my time in the Congo helped prepare me for the daunting task of learning about Rwanda's past. Now, the moment you enter Rwanda, you immediately feel like you're in a different country. The country is jam-packed with large hills and fertile valleys, a stunning green tea and coffee plantations, well-kept farmhouses line the roadway in the countryside. The country has a clean and orderliness to it. First the Germans and then the Belgians were quite intrigued with this, and the different tribes living there when they colonized the country. Those differences were exploited as a way to control people using the minority Tutsi to govern the majority Hutu. Later on, misguided efforts to try and right the imbalance only flamed the situation even more. Then eventually, years of resentment covered the hearts of the people, setting up the unthinkable genocide that started on April 6, 1994. In approximately 100 days, 800,000 people were killed. Now, this is a hard fact to come to terms with, especially in a culture like the United States where we don't deal with death very well. Friends turned against friends, neighbors against neighbors, leaving nowhere for those in danger to be safe. Even churches, normally a safe refuge, were targeted, and even unthinkably sometimes orchestrated by priests. They say the rivers turn to blood, in the heart of Kigali, Rwanda, is the Genocide Memorial which documents the genocide. At the site 
are also large mass graves where 250,000 people are buried with the names of the victims inscribed on a wall. While in Kigali, I also went to go visit the Belgium Memorial, the location that marks the point where the 11 UN Belgium soldiers were massacred. The bullet holes and the shrap metal holes from the grenades are a stark reminder of this moment in time. This was a pivotal point when the UN decided to pull out most of the troops, leaving Rwanda to fend for itself. The memorial also talks about other genocides. This sign reads, Hope is simply remembering, so it will never happen again. I decided to visit one of the starkest memorials outside the small town of Giangoro, called Murumbi. What once was a school became a killing factory. Several classrooms are now filled with the dead bodies of some of the 27,000 exhumed from the mass graves that littered the schoolyard. As I walked through the rooms and found myself surrounded by such pain, my heart sank with tears. A horrific and chilling reminder that such events must never be allowed to happen again. The entire school compound is now a genocide memorial. Here the guide shows me clothes retrieved from some of the mass graves. I stepped outside and I stared into the green countryside trying to gain some kind of emotional footing to move forward through the rest of the site. Sometimes I found it hard just to breathe. Before leaving, I knelt down next to the mass grave and took a moment of silence. And as I walked back to town, I found myself immersed with the undeniable feelings that we failed as a humanity. The memorial begs the question, how can we learn from such a horrible moment in time? Now Rwanda is attempting to find its way, looking for ways to move forward. The country has memorials to educate and to learn from the past. And there are heroic stories to come out of this mess, like the story based on the movie Hotel Rwanda. Here's the actual hotel. And then the last Saturday of every month, from 8 a.m. till noon, all businesses are closed, and the whole country takes the morning to clean the public spaces where they live. This seems to help create a sense of national pride and identity. And then whenever you see someone in a pink outfit like this, these are prisoners who participated in the genocide some way. Local neighborhood courts called Kagachka have been empowered by the government. Here the prisoners are put on trial who are accused of participating in the genocide, giving the community some sense of justice. Before leaving, I sit down with Yurira, a young staff member and optimistic woman who has worked for the current President Kagame of Rwanda for six years. We meet to talk about the future of Rwanda. We hit bottom low with the genocide, says Yurira. It can go nowhere else but up from here. The world is surprised by our resilience. If people don't think this is strength, then I don't know what strength is, she says. Our future is bright. There is. There is light at the end of the tunnel. A new chapter in the history of Rwanda has begun. Tune in again. There are more adventures to come from Africa. This is Dean Jacobs reminding you to check your compass because you never know where you might go with the Dean of Travel. <laughs>